Good morning everyone, my name is Michelle, I hope you're doing well. Welcome to another video. It is Monday morning the 29th of January and today we are sticking with the Michael Vaughan case. There are quite a few new people to this case at the moment because one of the named suspects, named by law enforcement, not named by YouTube or TikTok or anything like that, Stacey Wanderer has been talking. We're going to talk about that a little bit, but I've talked extensively about Stacey's, in my opinion, lies quite recently. I've got several videos and a live stream about Stacey's lives, so I'll just go back in my Michael Vaughan playlist. But for those completely new to the case, it's relatively straightforward to catch up. Michael was five when he went missing from his street, Southwest 9th Street in Fruitland, Idaho, on the 27th of July, 2021. So he has been missing for two and a half years. Two and a half years. His family have been in limbo, not knowing what on earth happened to their son. On the one year mark of Michael being missing, Fruitland PD released some new information. One of the pieces of information is what is on your screen, a man walking down the road. So I'm going to play a little bit from that press conference at the year mark. It fills in on some of the detail up to that point, and um, that's where we're going to start in this video. Let's go. Michael Joseph Vaughn was last seen at his residence on Southwest 9th Street at approximately 6.30 p.m. Tuesday, July 27, 21. Law enforcement re received the first call by 911 at 7.21 p.m. and we began an immediate search of the area. So you need to know the first missing and endangered alert went out at 8.20 uh, with different alerts to email, phone calls, text messages being issued to area residents until 11.20 that night. Michael's image and information went out to law enforcement nationwide on a database called the National Crime Information Center, or NCIC. Uh, and Michael's also been entered into the state of Idaho Missing Person Clearinghouse and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. The Fruitland Police, Payette Police, and Payette County deputies and citizens searched through the night until support arrived the following morning. The ensuing response was immense. We had over 100 law enforcement officers from federal, state, and local agencies, including the FBI Child Abduction Rapid Deployment Team, along with trained search teams, converge on our small city of Fruitland. Our physical search efforts were conducted by experts from the Idaho Fish and Game, the Idaho Mountain Search and Rescue, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, both Fruitland and San Paulo Fire Departments, multiple law enforcement agencies, and coordinated citizen searchers. The search included over 200 residential homes, properties including outbuildings, a septic tank, garbage cans, vehicles, irrigation ditches, and drain canals. Sophisticated <laughs> drones, boats with sonar, uh, boats with canines, kayaks, paragliders. I would say that if we could have dammed the Snake River, we would have. With the help of residences and businesses, uh, we were able to retrieve hours and hours of security camera video and we continue to reference that video while working on our leads. So let's talk about since the disappearance of Michael. When I tell you our investigation has been intense and daily, I can assure you that it has been. Uh, since the, the disappearance, detectives and, and investigators across the country have logged tens of thousands of man hours to bring this case to conclusion. We've gathered an immense amount of data and continue to work through it with experts from several agencies. We've applied for and served over 27 search warrants, uh, but that may seem low, but I'm telling you that we've also performed, uh, you know, probably triple that in mutual consent type searches. So the search warrant and consent searches we, we performed have yielded uh, high volumes of data and search warrants are still being written today. The data requires expertise from law enforcement partners and this takes a lot of time to decipher. We continue to use all of our investigative resources to include that of the Idaho State Police and our friends at the FBI. 
Further, the Idaho State Police and the FBI have assigned investigators to work specifically with the City of Fruitland Police Department on this case, and our partnership is healthy and strong. We continue to call upon the Idaho Mountain Search and Rescue teams uh, with their specialized canine units, and we perceive some recent leads that have put us out in the area again, um, searching more acreage. And I can't thank them enough for, for what they've done for us. Uh, on a moment's notice, they're jumping and running for us. Although unsuccessful with these, with these searches, we can't stop, and we appreciate the continued support from all of our members, and um, I would tell you that the number of acres searched will continue to grow. So in our efforts to develop a detailed timeline of events leading up to Michael's appearance, we processed over 1,000 leads. So we've cleared many of these leads, but not all have been cleared because some require assistance from out of state, uh, more investigators, and, 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 and probably more importantly, just time to work these things through to make sure we can bring each, le each lead to a conclusion. This process is exhaustive, and it takes a lot of time, and we believe someone out there will ultimately, ultimately provide us with some information that will help us solve this case. It's important to note that as we continue to refine our timeline, um, we now believe that Michael disappeared in a smaller window of time, and that's probably between the air, uh, time of 6.40 p.m. and 7 o'clock p.m. on the 27th. That was part of the press conference to mark the one year of Michael being missing, and it was a significant update in the case. They went through how rapidly they were able to get searchers out on the night that Michael disappeared, the 27th of July, 2021. So if Michael had been in that area, out there somewhere, they would have found him that night. But he wasn't there because there were monsters in the neighbourhood that night. They pinned down the time that Michael went missing into a 20 minute window between 6.40 and 7pm. No one had eyes on him during that time. And surprise, surprise, Stacey Wanderer now puts him, his wife Sarah, and one of the co-suspects, Brandon Shirtliff, into that precise area at that precise time. And we have to remember that according to Stacy, eyes were already on them. It was a few months after this press conference in November of 2022 that they dug up 1102 Red Wing Street, the backyard. According to Stacy, him and Sarah had already been interviewed and, according to him, polygraphed. So they were following very precise leads at that time. Obviously, they couldn't go into that because that was an ongoing investigation. One of the things they did release was this photograph, two actually. This one, and then there was this one from a security camera in the area. This is the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children. And uh, they said, on July 22nd, the Fruitland Police Department held a media briefing to update the public on the search for Michael and the continued investigation of his case. During the briefing, police announced that at this time they have received over 1,000 leads on Michael's disappearance and wanted to assure the public that they were thoroughly investigating each lead as it came in. The department also announced that in addition to the white Honda Pilot, which I believe is no longer in play. They were looking for the driver of a white Honda Pilot. Investigators are trying to identify a man seen walking through the splash pad area of Crestview Park leading up to the time of Michael's disappearance. The man is described as the following. A white male adult in his late 20s to early 30s seen wearing black shorts, a white t-shirt with cut off sleeves, dark coloured shoes and a hat. So Stacy confirmed that Brandon Shirtliff, Stacy's a liar, but he was wearing shorts that night. Is that Brandon Shirtliff? It could be. It looks like him. It's certainly not Stacy or Sarah, just by the build of it. They said the Cresswell Park area, so that's the splash pad, 
area. So I've been looking if I can find exactly where that is. So this is the splash pad right here. It doesn't appear to be the park area itself. You notice a few things. So this is a driveway, a double driveway, the pavement, and then over the road, there's another, it looks like another driveway there, possibly. And then there's like a post. So that looks like it's cut off, but it looks like another driveway. So where in that area might this be? It could be around here. This is Cornwall Way. Because they've got those kind of driveways. If you go down go down they've got that kind of paving and they've got that kind of driveway if we just move up can you see but it has to be an area where the driveway is directly across and there's a post on this side now one place I did look at was Red Wing Street where the Wanderers lived so this is uh, Red Wing Street and this is 1102 Red Wing Street. It says Mallard Street but the address is actually Red Wing Street. This is where they dug up the backyard in November 2022. You can see the shed there and that's what Stacey told them that Michael's remains were buried near the shed in their backyard and three different cadaver dogs hit in that backyard but yet they didn't find Michael's remains. In the press conference in December 2022 they said they believed Michael's body had been there but it had been moved. Now there's an area here on Red Wing Street which I thought looked maybe a little bit like this photo. So you've got this post thing, you've got a driveway, and then Brandon, if this is Brandon, let's just call him Brandon, might not be the Brandon, let's just call him Brandon for the sake of it, um, is walking past a driveway. So is there a driveway directly across? And there is. There's a driveway there. A driveway there. So do either of these houses have cameras? I can't see, but if you can look kind of there, if you're walking there, maybe the other one actually. I spent ages yesterday going around all these streets looking for a location. And that was the closest I could find. Could be that one or that one. Kind of looking out like that and you've got the post. There is going to be some distortion because there always is on these things. But I don't know. The, the, the reason why I spent so long looking at this was given this timeline that Stacy has given, I wondered whether we could pinpoint where Brandon was walking. This person that I'm calling Brandon might not be the Brandon, but just to give us some kind of indication of what was going on. Now, overnight my time, I've just listened to it now, the lab, Josh, had a guest who just happened to be in the chat and he invited him on. And that guest said that he was previously married to Sarah Wanderer. And she had this kind of fantasy that she talked about a lot of kidnapping someone. And she was abusive to him. She never went through with anything. She just wanted to kidnap somebody to control them, not specifically a child. I maintain that it's Sarah. Sarah is the instigator of whatever plan they had to take someone. I have another theory that they ran Michael over accidentally and he died and they panicked. That's still on the table for me. But given that we know that Sarah is this weird controlling person and that Stacey's lying through his teeth... Brandon's lying. I don't want to let my brain go there. I, I'd rather think of Michael being knocked over accidentally, but yet they didn't come forward and they've put 
Michael's family through two and a half years of just trauma. It, that's bad enough, but to think of a little boy like Michael being tortured, I, my brain can't go there. My brain cannot go there. That's why I'm kind of focused on the accident scenario. But if this was kidnap, they're lying. No one's spoken with Sarah because she's in jail on unrelated charges right now. And she was arrested in November 2022 for concealing the death of Michael, which would fit with an accident scenario. But it would also fit with a kidnap scenario if they kidnapped him, led by Sarah, because this was some kind of fantasy, and then they ended up killing him. I just don't want to think about that. It's just horrific. I put this together yesterday. This is all of Stacey's interviews with what he said in each interview and feel free to take a screenshot and use it, whatever. You can use any part of my videos as long as you give me credit. I always say that. Each interview, just what he said about that time, that time span, where they were out there, supposedly Stacey putting power steering fluid in the truck when they were on the corner of Arizona and Southwest 8th Street. This is just how his timelines evolved. He's done three interviews with Crime Lines and Lies. So the first interview he said between 5.30 and 5.45. That's when they got ready. But it was between 6 and 6.15 when they were on the corner of 8th and Arizona. At interview two he said between 5.15 and 5.30. In interview three he said they left about 5.30. Which he said was verified verified by the cops, I assume. And this is the first interview where he introduced seeing this child. So he said he saw a child who was by himself, didn't look like Michael at all, don't remember what he was wearing. Child was playing with some something, but he didn't know what, possibly standing by houses on the sidewalk in the distance. Could see his face, five, six or seven houses down on the right-hand side. Short, dark hair, didn't look five, maybe seven, eight, nine, and couldn't confirm the gender. No mention of a duffel bag yet. Then he spoke to KTVB News and said that they went to CUNA between 5.30 and 6pm. Remember, Michael went missing between 6.40 and 7. So in these first interviews, he's putting himself away from the area at the time Michael disappeared. True Crime with Eve, he said he left about 5.30. Said he saw the child down the street in a yard, maybe 5.35 to 5.40. Taller than Michael, don't know what he was wearing. Not Michael, because dogs didn't find scent on South West 8th Street. So yesterday's video, I talked about that you can't possibly see a child, anyone, in a yard, five, six, seven eight houses down. You can see maybe three houses down, but you just can't see. It's based on Google Maps, and obviously that's not real life. But his story evolved in uh, his interview with Dolly Vision. So he told Dolly that he left about 5.30. He introduced this not just to get Brandon's car, but to do some laundry and get water. Said that he saw a boy playing with something in someone's yard, dark hair, taller, than Michael, maybe nine or ten years old, about 5.40. And this is the interview where he brought in the duffel bag. So they brought Brandon's clothes to Cuna in Brandon's duffel bag, which was small and not big enough for a human. Nobody asked him whether it was big enough to fit a human in. In Justin Farrell's interview, he then puts himself at the exact scene at the corner of Southwest 8th, just a mere 100 feet or so, 150 feet, 160 feet from Michael's home between 6.30 and 7 at the exact time that Michael disappeared to do laundry and get Brandon's car. Never went to the gas station, as Brandon said. Stopped a little bit before Arizona and he said that they were on CCTV putting power steering fluid in. I can't see where they would be on CCTV. There is one house that maybe would capture something in the distance, but I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, and he said that the boy was further down eighth in the yard 
This time, he said he was wearing a bright shirt and shorts, but taller than age five. Talked a lot about the duffel bag. It was empty when Brandon put the clothes in. He had to get scoop his clothes up from the living room down the side of the couch. It was uh, medium size with handles. They brought the duffel bag back home with new clothes in. Sarah and Brandon went to Kuna the next day to get the clothes that he put in the washing machine. Then, just a couple of days ago, hidden true crime. So he said they were at the house until 6.30 and then they stopped a bit before Arizona to put the steering fluid in. The child was nothing like Michael, dark hair, Mexican, so we could now even tell this um, person's nationality, with shorts and a t-shirt between 8 and 10 years old, in a front yard, 7 to 8 houses down. You cannot see 7 to 8 houses down, but couldn't see the facial features. Duffel bag was empty when Brandon put the clothes in. Small with handles, not big enough to put a body in, but approximately three feet long. Now, not big enough to put an adult body in, unless you chop them up. But for a little five-year-old, a little boy who'd only just turned five, is that big enough to put someone in? Yes, absolutely. So Brandon always did his washing at CUNA, and then they went back the next morning. Look, guys, the reason why I want to know where this is is it possible that brandon was out and about scouting for someone is it that he went back for the duffel bag if it's brandon could be somebody completely unrelated we haven't heard from the cops as to whether this man is still in play but if he went back for a duffel bag like they parked on the corner of 8th and arizona and he ran back for a duffel bag because he looks like he's walking with purpose there why did they if it's Brandon. All right, guys, there's a lot to unpack here. Absolutely horrendous, horrendous situation. But Stacey, keep talking, son. Keep talking. Yeah. All right, guys, let me know your thoughts in the comments and I'll see you in the next video.